hold up, hold up, hold up. She fails at law school yeah. and goes to be goofy, fails at being goofy. It <laughs> doesn't even biggest, get the shot to be goofy. But, and she's a chipmunk. Yes. Uh, eventually. So this story doesn't start off. Great. Doesn't start off very well. Welcome to the Chasing Mountains podcast. We are very excited this week. Jacob, tell us what's going on. 10 plus million views on our dumbass channel. <laughs> I'm so blessed. We got 12,000 followers or subscribers this week alone. Um, we were excited when we hit 100. We have like 50 family members. So we were like, you know, half of that's family. <laughs> But, you know, this last week we had a video go viral and it got 10 million plus views. We are shocked and excited. Yeah, we we didn't expect this at all. Um, Weren't we aiming for like a, like 10,000 at the end of the year? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. That was super cool. You know, anytime you can see like the your, your analytics chart just, yeah. just shoot to the moon. Um, well, super I, cool. I know that when we started this channel, I said there are 7 billion people on this planet there's bound to be somebody <laughs> as weird as us. Yeah. Who wants to listen to <clears throat> us talk. And, you know, we love business. We love uh, like talking about people who are doing something great and we need inspiration daily. And so we look at those people and we try to find inspiration. We try to learn from them. And we've learned a lot also from like now the new subscribers. Um, we have uh, one video that has like a thousand plus um, comments on it. Comments on YouTube are very funny. So I've had a few belly laughs at my own expense. I love it. <laughs> Sometimes people are like right on the money and you're oh. like, all right, all right, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah, Can't yeah. argue with that. That's funny. So we did a video on Mr. Beast and Elon Musk. There was a tweet that was going on. You can go watch it. We'll put a link in the description. But it, when we first posted it, it got like 3,000 views and we're like, whatever. And it went on. A month later, for some reason, it started like getting good traction. I want to point out like, a lot of people commented that this was this was kind of a like stupid topic and silly conversation. I think that was the point. And you're right. Like it was, it, I think it was relevant. Yes. They're not, these two people are not nobodies, mm -hmm. whether their opinion matters to you. Uh, and it was, you know, obvious kind of just like public sort of conversation between two celebrities. It's kind of meant to get some, some yeah. attraction between the two of them. But when you talk about two juggernauts on the internet. Yeah. You know, Elon Musk is the techno you king. You mean you and me or what uh, are we talking about? Not us. Oh, okay. Like, uh, uh, but no, those two guys, they, they know how to work the internet. So we were talking yeah. about both of them and, and the biggest catch for everybody was they hated that. I said he was a business pro. What people need to understand though, that came out of an hour long conversation. Now, Mr. Beast, I'm telling you is a business pro. Just how that short phrased it out. It, people that, Oh, it's just a tweet. It was, but also when you make people mad on the internet, they watch the video a few times and they'll leave a few comments. So yeah. maybe it was on purpose, but it made us decide that we're going to get a business pro button <laughs> that when we decide someone's a business pro, we're going to slam that button and it's going to go business. It should pro. be in between us. And whenever somebody does something business pro ish that we're talking about, the first one of us to hit it. Ooh, wins. it's sort of like a family feud. Like mm -hmm. the first to yes. get to it <clears throat> yells business pro or the voice mm -hmm. business pro the business pro gets to be on our team. Nice. We select them for our team. Very excited and thankful for everybody who's subscribed to this channel. Yeah. Um, you know, seriously, like this is, super grateful. I think we just we're trying to learn um, and forcing us to get here every week, record a podcast, edit the shorts, edit clips, get feedback from people. I think is why we're doing this, right? Yeah. Just to, so thank you, everybody. But we are not just celebrating today. We're talking about someone who is a badass, Sarah Blakely. She's the founder of the company and the brand Spanx. Um, if you don't know Spanx, we, we, we kind of thought this might be a funny moment where the two of us try to describe this oh. product. Uh, so he's 35. I'm 39 <laughs> years old. Now we both have wives, but us trying to under like explain women's undergarments might be interesting. So why don't you- In like a clear, concise, professional business podcast kind of way. Yeah, but, to a bunch of <clears throat> probably guys listening. So what is a Spanx? Spanx, it's a women's shapewear brand, which is basically kind of the modern day, uh, like new and improved version of, of tights essentially, but it's meant to wear under your clothes and hide. Um, as, as Sarah Blakely, the founder, says it, it creates a blank canvas so that you're not seeing like 
underwear showing through. You're not seeing any, you know, lines of things that, that you're not supposed to see. Because so. like I wear jeans, I wear, you know, thick pants. You're not going to really see my boxer lines. You're not going to see my underwear line. But if, if a lady is wearing something that's nice and soft and thin and you got a panty line, that's, they, they, they don't like that. Right, Bobby? That's not are really we, the goal. Are we on track here, Bobby? We're or? very on track. <laughs> um, so, I mean, like, so someone doesn't want that. If they're going like a business trip or whatever, they don't want their panty line showing. So um, she invented this Spanx. It's tight wear that helps shape and lift the butt. This it really wasn't something out there. There was pantyhose that women could wear. Let me get the background right quick yep. on Sarah Blakely. <laughs> I'm going to start this out by explaining that she failed the LSAT, which is the entrance exam for law school. She tested to get in, failed it, uh, decided, call it a crisis moment, whatever, but decided that she was going to drive to Disney to audition to be goofy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was that was kind of... <laughs> wait, what? <laughs> yep. Uh, I, then, I, wait, I mean, I've had those come to Jesus moments too, where it's just like, all right, nothing's working. I yeah. Guess well, I'm- it gets better just to add insult to in- injury. She gets there, finds out she's too short and they want her to be one of the chipmunk instead. She doesn't meet the height requirement because Goofy's pretty tall. <laughs> so, hold, up, hold, up, hold up. She fails at law school. It yeah. goes to be Goofy, fails at being Goofy. It <laughs> doesn't even biggest, get the shot to be Goofy. But, and she's a chipmunk. Yes. Uh, eventually. So this story doesn't start off. Great. Doesn't start off very well. So, but it ends. lays the groundwork for yeah. someone who things maybe aren't going great for her, not as planned. She ends up uh, eventually selling fax machines. She's selling fax machines door to door, which cannot be an easy gig if you've ever done door to door sales. If you want to hear no a thousand times, try to sell a copy machine, fax machine to a business who's trying to save as much money as they can. And they will squeeze every last ounce of life out of that fax machine and printer. So she heard no. A thousand times. Mm-hmm. And I think that maybe taught her something in the beginning that it's okay to hear now. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's a big lesson in sales. I mean, be prepared to, to hear that for sure. Well, she, she saved up uh, about 5,000 bucks selling fax machines um, to start the company Spanx in 2000. Uh, never took a business class. The, the idea came to her just out of her own need. It was her own necessity to, to get more out of her clothing. Um she says she originally cut the feet out of pantyhose um, and realized that that the it, like in order to accomplish what we talked about, kind of hiding some of the lines and, and to give her that blank canvas to work from. But she realized that the concept of shapewear, uh, which at the time was was basically pantyhose, um, could be done much better. So she took an already <clears throat> existing product, yeah, or concept, existing okay. concept, and she was a frustrated consumer because this product wasn't offering what she needed and what she thought. It should be doing. She kind of took this on. She took this on and sought out a manufacturer, um, actually sat on the idea for like at least a year. Didn't talk about it with people, didn't tell anybody, didn't like immediately go out. Like most people, you get some kind of business idea or, you know, a new I don't know, invention or whatever, and you want to immediately just, you're excited about it. But uh, she said that was actually a really good lesson was to, to just sit on it so that basically people wouldn't tell her no. People wouldn't tell her, ah, oh, that's, you sure you want to do that? That's a bad idea. Well, she had looked into figuring out like, well, first off, is this a thing that I could do? Can I patent this thing? And for patenting, I don't completely understand everything about patenting, but you got to figure out, is someone else out there doing it? Can I get a legal binding thing from the government that says, this is my thing. Here's how I made it for this amount of time. Nobody's allowed to manufacture this. And so she decided to go to the library looking through patent books, figuring out if it's there. Day one, day two, day three. She's going through book after book after book. This is really before the internet was a massive thing. And on the seventh day, some guy came to her and says, why don't you just go to the patent website? And she was like, what? And so she looked at, she checked it out when she got home. And sure enough, here was this website that had all the patents on it. And she was just like, it was like a heavenly moment where she like I can do it now. It's Could online. hear the angels singing. Oh, yeah. But it goes to show her, her determination, like going to the library, opening up books, looking through to see if her patent would infringe upon anything else. And she ended up writing her own patent because it was too expensive, three to $5,000 what they told her. And so she did everything. She had her mother actually draw out the picture. So in her patent to this day, the picture that's on there is the one from her mom. Hmm. And what's also interesting, she got to a point where she was like, I can do no more. So she went to a lawyer friend that she knew and she said, will you finish this for me? And it was just a few more details. And he charged like 700 bucks. 
finished the patent and uh, yeah, pretty cool stuff. That's a, uh, I think a fairly complex thing, U.S. patent law um, in, in the process, but. But it goes to show she's not dumb. Like, no, even though she failed at law school, Lord knows I would fail at law school. <clears throat> Let's get to the redeeming part of this, this story, because uh, it definitely probably feels like we're, we're picking on her for failing law school, going to Disney. Just to cut to the end of the story, it, it works out okay. <clears throat> Very okay. Very okay. So she goes to kind of move to a production, but she realized that people making women's shapewear weren't even women. She, she talks about this moment where she looks around the factory floor and it's all men. You know, you talk about a competitive advantage. Uh, what do these, bunch of these dudes know about women's shapewear, how it feels, how it wears, how it should be cut. Um, so she knew instantly that that was, you know, that was a uh, competitive advantage for her. But, but skipping ahead in 2012 at 41 years old, she was named the youngest self-made female billionaire by Forbes magazine. So for 21 years, she uh, had been the sole owner of the company uh, until selling it recently. She, she never took any outside investment for 21 years. Um, so, so started it from nothing, ran it. And, uh, eventually, uh, she, she recently within the, I think it was 2021, uh, sold a majority stake of Spanx to, uh, the global investment group, Blackstone. Uh, the company was valued at $1.2 billion. Uh, Sarah maintains a significant equity stake and became executive chairwoman on the company's board of directors. Uh, also just kind of a neat thing. She, she sold to an all female buying team, uh, on the Blackstone side, uh, led by, um, a woman named Ann Chung, who I've seen in, in some interviews, um, super, super cool. Like, like, you know, she knows her stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, like she's you, one of those probably, probably people that make you feel stupid no matter what you do or say, just like. She's not even talking, yeah. she's, not, she's not even getting into really highly technical things, but just hearing her in interviews talk about why buying Spanx was a good idea. And I'm just like, mm. just, yeah. this is an intimidating human well, you being. You know, you run into some people and you're like, oh, wow, they're a different, different <laughs> breed of people. They're yeah. way better than I am. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but I, I, so that's the story. That's the story. We can kind of get into some, you know, some just unique, interesting things, but, but that's who she is. That's, that's the story of her and Spanx. Um, and, you know, kind of from nothing to, to eventually selling. That's the dream, by the way, yeah. uh, you know, building this company up, selling it off for a billion dollars and then, you know, getting to, to raise your kids. She's got, uh, three boys. She's married to Jesse Itzler, who's also an entrepreneur, author, uh, rapper or former, I don't know if he still raps, but, uh, former music industry guy. Talk about a successful family. Yeah. Right. Sarah Blake. He's very wealthy too. Billionaire, right? her husband, musician, writer, Explorer, rich. I mean, talk about making me feel like a schlub. He's yeah. the guy, <clears throat> for those that may not know Jesse Hitzler, he, he's the guy that uh, you've, you've probably heard maybe his story on Joe Rogan's podcast where he had David Goggins, uh, former Navy SEAL, come live with him for a period of time. Did you hear about this? 30 days. Is it 30 days? Yeah. Literally, if you're going to invite anybody to your house for 30 days, number one, that's too long to have anybody stay at your house. <laughs> yeah. But two, David Goggins. That's a scary thing to do. I mean, that's a crazy thing to do. That man will make you literally cook breakfast and do push-ups at the same time. <laughs> and, and curse you out yeah, first thing in the morning. <laughs> yes. And then for some reason you're saying, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. And then you get it done. But I mean, talk about a motivating person. David Goggins. We should talk about him in the future. Yeah, we should. Um, his book is really good. So uh, that's, that's the kind of, I mean, that's her household too. She's got David oh, Goggins in her house. Can you imagine well, so. waking up 4.30 in the morning to David Goggins next to your bed going, it's time to wake up. Like the guy's an animal. But um, one thing I, I, if you don't mind, um, please a little bit about Sarah talking about sticking with it. Uh, you said men just couldn't grasp this product when she was saying that this or at is least not well, they no. thought they, they thought they had it. Um, but they were using like uh, mannequins, I think, to yeah. to like test the fit of the right. product, which I guess kind of works. It it worked for shapewear up until that point, pantyhose and stuff, but but clearly not enough because she identified like, hey, this could be done better. Before she went and got actually product to sell, she wanted to first find a manufacturer, but nobody would manufacture this for her because they thought it was stupid. In fact, she got rejected time and time and time again, same way she did before, like with selling the, the fax machines. But a guy who actually told her no, that thought it was a dumb idea, had three daughters. And come to find out years later, he actually talked to his daughters about this product, mm -hmm. kind of just 
haphazard, just talked about it. And they were like, no, dad, this thing needs to exist. So he calls her back and says, hey, Sarah, this is Tim or whatever his name was. Um, I, I want to do it. And we'll, we'd love to manufacture your product. And she's just jumping out of a chair, freaking out. And she's like, that's wonderful. That's great. And th they designed a few things. Anyway, she gets a hold of Neiman Marcus cold call. She called, which Neiman Marcus is a, a, a big, big blockbuster of a store. And she actually cold called them, looked up in the phone book, called their office. And they're like, no, you need to get a hold of textiles. You need to get. So basically they told her how to get a hold of the right person. Mm. She gets a hold of the person and says, I have a revolutionary product that will make your clients look better in your clothes, which wonderful pitch. Mm. And the girl said, I'll give you 10 minutes of my time if you'll fly here. So she did, she gets there. And when she's pitching it in the conference room, it's not going well. So she actually says to the lady who she was talking with, come to the restroom with me. Well, first off, that's weird. Which is weird in the middle of a, yes. a, a business pitch meeting. Yes. Like, you know, it's not going well. And then you're asking someone, come to the restroom. I'll show you exactly how this thing works. So she goes in, puts on her dress or her pants that she didn't like how she looked in it and showed her and then went back in, tried the, the, the product on, came out and she came out and the woman was like, I get it. This is great. And put in an order that day. Mm. So she gets a hold of the manufacturer and says, Tim, we got an order. I need you to make stuff. And he was silent on the phone for what she said felt like 10 minutes. And he said, Sarah, I'm going to be honest with you. I thought you were going to be giving these out for the next 10 years at birthdays and Christmases for, he's like, I just didn't think anybody would buy them. So she gets them into Neiman Marcus, but they put them like back in the back of the store. So she actually went out, printed out, like she didn't like where they were. Nobody could see them. And there was a small skew. She was paying her friends to go in and buy them. And then wow. she was reimbursing them later. So like they, they would go buy it. Then she'd write them a check later just to have some inventory go through. <laughs> and then she realized no one That's was like really buying followers online. Oh yeah. <laughs> Which we got accused of that. That was interesting. Yeah. We can tell you with full honesty that that did not happen. We can't afford it. <laughs> we don't have the, uh, the budget. No, but yeah, no. So one Sarah day, once we get some money, we're going to buy the crap out of some followers. No, we're not. <laughs> It'll kill your YouTube channel. Um, she realized nobody was watching. So she went and actually printed up really nice looking boxes, put her product in the boxes, put them at the front register. And everybody just assumed that someone on the uppity up knew what, <laughs> that these were supposed to be here. So at every register, there were spanks. Wow. And so it started selling like hotcakes and then it turned into the billion dollar company that it is. And I just appreciate that drive, man. So let me, let me comment on that. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it does not surprise me that that is something you appreciate because I've watched you do those kinds of things, working with you and being in business with you. To um, your embarrassment, right? <laughs> sometimes, but I've learned to just shut up and, and like, the, it works, man. It, it works. Does. I mean, uh, so never underestimate a cold call. <clears throat> well, so you've said you'll be the first to say that like a lot of the time, a lot of the scenarios that, that you and I have found ourselves in often because you've got us into those scenarios <laughs> that we had no business being there mm. uh, in front of the right people at the right time. Um, you know, whether that's clients or partners or, 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 you know, an audience of some sort, but uh, you know, just it, it's, it's funny how when you don't necessarily know the rules of business and you're not constricted by that business etiquette, that sometimes just, you can so clearly see from point A to B. You know, there's, there's no, like, I would say that I, I, I'm almost positive when I say this, that at those big stores, those big, um, you know, clothing stores and, and big box stores and stuff, there's like contractual agreements around what's going to sit at the register. Like there's a whole economy built around where your product sits on the shelf, like how high, where in the store, things like that. So she's probably breaking all kinds of rules when it oh, comes to yeah. that. But I mean, it's not like she did it for 20 years. I think she did it for just a little bit, but it, it sure, brought some but, sales up. Sure. But I'm just saying like, she didn't know someone who, who is a, you know, like really, really versed like business expert who a business pro, yeah. as we might say, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> business pro. <laughs> someone who's a business pro, uh, might be a little bit more constricted or confined by some of these, uh, you know, like I said, quote rules, whereas she's just like, Hey, like, why don't I just put my product by the register? Seems like a good idea. Let's do it. And it works. I love it. Um, whereas somebody else is gonna be like, oh no, I couldn't do that. I couldn't, no way. Like, so I can say that I've seen firsthand that, that, mm -hmm. that kind of thing works really well. 
I'm so, like, can I go down a rabbit hole real quick? Yeah. My first that's, time that's, that I got I Warner. Thought that, I thought our entire podcast was just giant rabbit hole. <laughs> that's what the, <laughs> that'd be a weird podcast. <laughs> giant rabbit hole. Uh, I wanted Warner Brothers as one of my clients from my video production company. And I told my coworkers, I want to get Warner Brothers as our, our client. If I get Warner Brothers as one of our clients and we could do some of their music videos, our, our company's going to blow up. It'll do well. And I got some negative feedback, just to say the least. And But what I did was- From I, the team? From the team. Saying? Just not in a, a bad way. Just like, come on, we got better things to do. That's not going to work out. Like, you know, how are we going to do that? We don't even have a way of getting a hold of anybody. So I literally just cold called. I got a hold of the front desk. And talked to that lady for like 20 minutes, became her friend. She was a preacher on the side. And then she also did security. And then she's (laughs) like, you know what, honey, I'm going to pass you through to the next person. I went to the next person. I talked to them for like five minutes. Then the next person. And then then I got a hold of someone who's, you know, our friend right now. I won't say her name because I think she's working for a competitor. But um, yeah, we got a hold of her and I did my pitch, my elevator pitch. And she's like, yeah, sure. And I kind of was taken back like, Excuse me. She and she gave me a job that day. I think it was actually two jobs. And it not was for, a job to employ you, but you mean no. gave you work. Oh, gave like, us work. Yeah, yeah, it was a music video for Cole Swindell, lyric video actually, two yeah. two lyric videos. And I got off that phone call and I was just like, well, I heard no a bunch of times, but then eventually got to a yes. Cold call. I promise you, sometimes works. If you want to cut through the noise, just pick up the damn phone. Yes. Like. So many people want to get in touch with people through email or Instagram or social or whatever. And like, you know, there's, there's a time and a place for yeah. sure. But sometimes just a way to, to stand out is just to actually call somebody, uh, you know, in today's day and age. But um, And being honest, just like, I was like, hey, I'm noob here. Just trying to like, we've done a lot of really cool stuff on YouTube. We've, you know, this many views. We'd love to do this for your clients. Well, like, so, so the important second part of that, though, that I want to make sure to mention is it's one thing to get them on the phone. You also crushed it. When you got the work, you poured oh, yeah. everything into it. Yeah. I think we actually spent more on making the video than we got paid for the video. Yep. But, but it was strategic. It was. Crushed it. Did an awesome job. And then they kept, they kept calling you. Mm-hmm. So. And got, it led to gobs of other clients. Yeah. Because so, I just, so I, I really, <laughs> uh, when we, we talked about people who we wanted to, to, to mention on this podcast, Sarah was one of the first people I actually thought about. Yeah. She was on our yeah, list. Was- just, I love the fact that, you know, people did not believe in her so much so that they weren't asking for a percentage on the way up, you know, like, oh, well, we'll loan you money, but we want 25% of this. They thought she was going to fail. Mm-hmm. So Which why- she kind of used to her advantage. She was sort of oh, the yeah. unlikely hero, you know, as far as anybody was concerned. Yep. But it led to yeah. her owning 100% of her company yep. and able to sell out. So I, I mentioned... This person, Ann Chung with uh, Blackstone Group. One of the things that I believe it was her that said this when they were kind of assessing the value of the company. Ann said the the word that women use most in describing their attitudes towards the brand is grateful. So the product is like deeply tied into consumer self-esteem and their per- perception of self. Um, but like when you're assessing whether to buy a company and the most commonly used words by those consumers is grateful wow. for, for the brand. Hmm. Like that's a home run. And, you know, that's to develop that brand, to develop that product, carry it for 21 years to have that be your consumer feedback. Like not, oh yeah, I like the product or yeah, it's really good. It's effective. It's cheap to say that you're grateful that it exists and grateful for the brand. Like that's, that's pretty serious. Like that's heavy. Like there's not a lot of products. Like I like mac and cheese, but it's, (laughs) I'm not grateful. I'm not grateful. In fact, I'm regretful. (laughs) But like grateful is a, I mean, that's That's, cool. That's some brand loyalty for sure. Well, one thing too about her, we talked about this before the podcast, but man, she seems so nice and so cool. Like so chill. Sarah does. Yeah. Yeah. Sarah does. Yeah. I, um, I mean, so does Anne for that matter, but yeah, (laughs) I just would encourage people like, look, it's okay to hear no. It's okay to hear no a thousand times, but eventually there's going to be a yes. One of the, th- just talking like sales, you're talking a sales scenario where people are saying no. Uh, something I heard her uh, talking with um, Tony Robbins about was that you need to be aware that like there are different, it's essentially like love languages. If you're familiar with the concept of love languages that like oftentimes in communication with other people, you find that you try to love them the way you want to receive love. And that's where there's a lot of 
like problems in relationships because not everybody wants to receive love the mm. same way. So it's it's literally your your love language, how you communicate your love, and how you want to you know give that to someone. For it example, isn't necessarily how you want to. My wife it. loves touch. She loves to be hugged. She loves to hold hands. That's how she communicates her love. I communicate my love by spending time with them, doing something for mm. them, making them something, fixing their car. It's a way of giving and showing my love. Those are two different things. Yeah. She's wanting to receive love. And I'm like, I'm going to go fix your car for you. And really, she just wanted me to hold her hand yeah. and watch a movie. 100%. And so in a sales environment, you need to recognize that those same types of communication barriers and communication uh, dynamics exist. So when she was selling fax machines door to door, she became very good at very quickly recognizing, okay, is this somebody that I need to be, that's really analytical and I need to talk about all the specifications and details and, you know, manufacturing uh, of, of this, this fax machine, or is this somebody instead that I just need to like build a relationship with and maybe ask for a glass of water mm -hmm. and just kind of hang out for a while, get, you know, have them get to know me personally and then they'll come around to buy a fax machine. So, so identifying those things was, was uh, really important, but. She said something to Tony Robbins that I thought was, was really cool. And it's, it's really obvious, but she realized that in sales, in a sales scenario that consumers, they instantly want to know what's in it for me, especially door to door. When you've approached them, uh, like you're soliciting, you've approached them. They didn't ask you to be there necessarily. And you're coming to them and trying to sell them with something. Just to answer in the door, they're standing there immediately. They want to know like, okay. What do you need from me? What's in it for me? We've all been there. You oh, get yeah. kind of that call that you didn't ask for, um, or somebody does come, you know, come to the door. What's in it for me? And so if you can sell to that question early on in the conversation, essentially immediately, if you can identify what's in it for this person, because so often we don't do that in a sales situation. We often don't even do that in, in conversation. We take forever to kind of get to the, 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 the meat of it at the point of it, but uh, to start off and lead with, Here's why I'm talking to you. Is that why she did so well with pitching to Neiman Marcus? I have a product Probably. that will revolutionize how your clients feel in your clothes. Mm -hmm. Talk about that's it. A, like, it's awesome. That's a great line. I mean, shoot, that's some good stuff. Good wisdom right there. Business pro. Business pro. <laughs> Slap ding, the ding, 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 ding. <laughs> We're going to get a business pro button. Bobby, can you help us buy one? Just a button, a red button, and we'll put business <laughs> pro on it. Um, look, I know we joke, but go watch the video and you'll understand the, uh, the, the one that Mr. Beast, the Elon. Mr. Beast link in the bio. A couple of lessons. Can we talk about some kind of takeaways and lessons yeah. from, from Sarah Blakely? Mm -hmm. One of the things that I, that really stuck with me in her story is that like, there are opportunities in our everyday life all the time that we can improve upon a process or a product. Um, or you can at least identify that the process or product needs improved. Um, one of the things I heard her say that was, um, that's, that's super true and really powerful. She says, people start businesses for two reasons. One is to provide something that doesn't exist or two to make something that exists better. And again, if you think about all the times and, you know, in a single day that you might think like, wow, I, you know, this process, I wish this doing this thing was easier, you know, laundry or dishes or like, you know, normal household thing, mowing the lawn, whatever. Or, you know, you think like, I wish this product had this, you know, just this one more feature, um, then my life would be easier. And if you really kind of get, get down to the bottom line of that, like that's how all innovation happens with like home and personal products is like either something new comes in to, to do a job we didn't know that we needed done, uh, or to do it better. You know, you talk about the Roomba. I was literally just thinking about that. People are tired, of, you know, vacuums. Like it was, it was a broom forever to clean your house, to sweep in your house. Then people were like, okay, what about a vacuum sweeper that would sort of automate this process, do it a little bit better. And then people are like, man, I don't, I don't like having to do this manually all the time. I wonder if, you know, we can make it better. And then they did. And then literally they came out with a way that it empties its own self mm -hmm. into another vacuum, like mm -hmm. a little, it sucks it out, puts it in a bag. So my Roomba, I don't have to touch for a week and it works every single night and it's That's in awesome. my wife's salon. So yes. That Roomba started out as a broom years ago. <laughs> yeah. But that's the beauty is like that, that, that little bit of an adaptation. Yeah. And so it, yeah, it just really struck me and I've heard other entre entrepreneurs talk about this, this concept, but like if you can solve your problem, like in your immediate sphere and in Sarah Blakely's case, it was, it was <laughs> her underwear was shown through her clothes. 
So like that was the problem she needed to solve that problem. If you can solve a problem for yourself, you can probably solve that problem for somebody else. And if you can solve somebody else's problem, then you're laying the foundation for building true wealth and true innovation uh, in the future. I mean, it, you know, it's like, that's how you get to the point where you can bring a product to market or right. bring an improvement to a product and, and it blow up. Dude. Yeah. Cool lady. Someone I would love to meet one day. She does seem like a cool lady. Obviously we've never worked for her. I hope she's sitting somewhere on a beach, enjoying life and hanging out with her kids and man, good for yeah. her. Built a business up from nothing. And that's awesome. I mean, just cr- introduce a product to the market, uh, <laughs> build it to valuation of 1.2 billion. It's mm. awesome. Yep. Killer business pro business pro ding, 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 ding. All right. Well, let's wrap this podcast up. I'm sorry about my weird Abe Lincoln beard. I had to ch- shave my mustache for mysterious reasons. I'll, I'll explain later. <laughs> no, I, I just mysterious sh- reasons. Please, please elaborate. We <laughs> don't just leave it on that. I was exfoliating my face and it just wasn't going well with my mustache. I thought I was on vacation this week and thought I could uh, be away from everybody, but apparently I had to go into the office and do a couple podcasts today. So like get in here and podcast. Yeah. So sorry for the Abe Lincoln mustache, um, but that's it. We're chasing mountains podcast. See ya. The thoughts and opinions on this show do not reflect those of our advertisers, employers, or other affiliates. The content should not be considered legal or financial advice. The Chasing Mountains podcast is a production of Chasing Mountains Media. Copyright 2022.